Okay, so we're going to talk about microbiology, and uh, I would take a couple of notes because you're going to be able to use them on the reading quiz that we're going to do here in just a little bit, and the bacteria ID thing. There'll be a few things that uh, will make it a lot easier if you've got those. All right? All right, I'm going to turn one of the lights down there. There we go. Can you take some notes? It would be helpful. That's probably not going to happen. Okay, so we're going to talk about prokaryotes today. We've already talked about viruses. And then later on, we're going to discuss protists and fungi as well. These are all of these things can be uh, pathogenic to us. They, they can cause disease, okay? Um, some of them we do need. So prokaryotes today, who can give me an example of a prokaryote? What's prokaryote? Starts with a B. We got there. Bacteria, yeah, that's right. Bacteria, the archaebacteria, those are the only prokaryotes. Very simple forms of life, right? But yet still alive as opposed to viruses that are not. Okay, here we go. Prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are very simple creatures. They're single celled. Now they can live in like chains, they can be arranged in groups and clumps, but really they're just single celled organisms, okay? They are very unlike you in many ways as you're a eukaryote. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have complex organelles, they do have some stuff. They're, they're more complex than a virus by far. There's no doubt in our minds that these things are living. Whereas the virus we talked about the other day, you know, it's kind of in the land of not quite non-living, but yet not quite living. It's kind of this weird in-between sort of thing. So we don't recognize it as a living creature. So these things have a cell wall, which is kind of a hardened structure that surrounds the outside. Inside of that is a cell membrane Everything that's alive needs some sort of a thing to sell it off from the outside, and that's what the membrane essentially does. We don't have cell walls, but plants do, so do fungi. So other forms of life do have cell walls. Uh, inside of the bacteria, you can see that there's a chromosome, so there's some DNA in there. But it's not in a nucleus, it's kind of all strung around all free. The other thing that you'll notice in there are ribosomes, which we'll talk more about later. They are a type of an organelle, if you will. They're like the most basic, simplest organelle that everything that's alive pretty much needs to have because um, they help with decoding the DNA and making proteins. Okay, so get down that they don't have organelles, they don't have a nucleus, single cells, cell wall, ribosomes, We've got some DNA in there. Sometimes they have a flagella. They don't always have this, but it's a whip-like tail. Kind of works like a little motor. So they can move around. Some let's say they have little projections that come off of them that help them adhere to other cells to feed. All right, let's take a look at how big these things are. And we mentioned this the other day, but the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote is pretty striking. Eukaryotic cells are humongous in comparison to a prokaryotic cell. Okay, just to give you some scale, there's a ruler up here. Now, ignore the, the English side here with the inches on it because they don't use, we don't use that in science, right? It's very confusing. And look at the metric side up here. One of these big units is a centimeter. What do we call the little lines in between the centimeters? Anybody? Centimeters, next step down, it starts with an M. Millimeters, yes, millimeters. It's even labeled right there. So there are 10 millimeter lines in a centimeter. The metric system is always divided in tens, okay? So no matter what we're talking about, it always divides in tens, which makes it very, very convenient to use. If you take one of those little millimeter sections right there, this funny symbol up here, like the upside down U and the M right there, stands for a micrometer or a micron, okay? A micrometer, there are a thousand divisions in just one of those tiny little millimeters, right? So if that's two microns, that means it's two thousandth of a millimeter. That is tiny, like stupid tiny, but we can just barely see it under the microscope. You will see these downstairs. They will look like little dots. And you'd be like, that's a bacteria? Yep, it's a little dot. If we had a more powerful microscope, you'd see it better. Where does the virus land? Think about that picture I showed you the other day with the virus attached to the bacteria. If the bacteria is two thousandth of a millimeter, <laughs> the virus is an itsy-bitsy speck on top of that. 
So they are really tiny, right? We're not going to see those downstairs in lab. In comparison, one of your cells could be upwards of like 30 micrometers. So quite large in comparison to that thing. All right? Prokaryote versus eukaryote. The big deal, though, the big difference is the nucleus. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. Think pro, no. Eukaryotes like you do. Now, prokaryotes reproduce. They've got some very different weird ways of doing that that we're maybe not so used to. One way they do it is called binary fission, where the cells just grow larger and then divide. It's a complete cloning process. They copy all their DNA. One, set, one complete set of chromosomes goes in one cell, the other complete goes in the other, and then the thing divides and you have two. Okay, so they grow like other forms of life. They get too big for their britches, and then they have to divide. So they copy all their DNA and divide up. That's kind of somewhat normal. Conjugation is a weird one. Conjugation is actually kind of one of the reasons that bacteria are a little scary. Because bacteria can do this form of sexual reproduction. It's kind of like a form of sexual reproduction where they actually swap their DNA. So I'll show you a picture here in a second, but what occurs is two bacteria come close to each other and they grow a bridge. It's called a conjugation bridge between the two. It's like a little tube, like a little straw. And then one bacteria will pass a little loop of DNA to the other bacteria. And the other bacteria will be able to read it and use it. That is unlike anything else that we have experienced in life as humans, right? That would kind of be like, and this is a bit of a stretch of an analogy, but it would kind of be like me walking up to somebody and putting my hand on their shoulder and somehow merging our cells in a way where I absorbed some of their DNA and I walked away and changed my hair color because I like their hair color. <laughs> it's really weird, right? It's a very different way. But bacteria are kind of like little, I don't know, DNA vacuums. They just kind of slurp it up and can use it. It's very different. Another thing bacteria do is form an endospore. Some of them can do this, not all of them. Uh, and it's their way of protecting themselves against harsh environments. So when it gets too salty or too dry or too hot or too cold, some bacteria can basically ball up in this little spore inside their cell and survive it. Now they're completely inert, like there's no metabolism going on. It's like they're a little dead seed. And then when conditions get good again, they start to grow again and do their thing. So how long do bacteria live? In some cases, we're not really sure. Some of them might like really be immortal unless you kill them, like heat them up and burn them or pop them, right? So we don't really know. I and mean, if you're talking about how long do they live, they keep dividing which one was the original one, right? <laughs> so they're pretty tough little buggers. Uh, but each of these things are adaptive in some way, okay? Let's look at how those look here on a little picture. Over on the right is binary fission. So the cell just gets larger. The DNA is all copied. One copy goes to one cell, one copy goes to the other. And then a new cell wall forms between the two. And now you have two. Which one's the original? Well, kind of like half of both, right? It's the same creature, it's a clone. Over here is conjugation. So we've got two bacteria cozening up together here. And one of them passes a little bit of DNA over to the other one. And now the, the other one has those genes. Now, I said this was scary. Partly this is scary because bacteria evolve so rapidly. We talked about viruses evolving. Well, bacteria can do that very rapidly as well. And it has to do with the fact that they reproduce so fast. They can grow and divide so rapidly that you can start out with just a few and a short while later have thousands or millions of the things. Think about the process of binary fission where the, all this DNA has to be copied. Do you think mistakes are ever made? Yeah, occasionally mistakes happen. Occasionally mutations occur. Sometimes those are useful to the bacteria. Most of the time they probably don't do anything. But with this many copies, hundreds upon millions of copies being made rapidly, there's rapid evolutionary change. Like the, the, the genes can change pretty rapidly. And if they do change, all it takes is one bacteria to meet up with another bacteria and pass those genes along, and suddenly the other bacteria has them. Now, how does that work out in real life? Well, have you heard of antibiotic resistance before? Antibiotic resistant bacteria? Have you ever heard of MRSA? 
No? A little bit, yeah? So how about resistant staph or a staph infection? Like most of us hear the word staph infection. We think, ooh, that's kind of scary, right? So these are things like people are like worried maybe to go to the hospital because there might be staph there and they don't want to get infected with it, right? Uh, a staph infection or a MRSA infection is just a bacteria that's become resistant to all known antibiotics. Now, how does that occur? Well, it's a little bit of a process, but through exposing them to these antibiotics, eventually you end up with some that have evolved resistance. And then those that have evolved resistance can do conjugation and give it to the others. And then they're all resistant, and now we've got a problem, and we're back to the dark ages. In the olden days, when somebody got a bacteria infection, when they cut their arm, and it, and, it, and it was infected, you know what I'm talking about, like it's red and nasty, that's typically bacteria that is basically eating your body and making you sick, right? It gets red and swollen, it hurts. Now, nowadays, we dump some alcohol on it, put some peroxide on it, sanitize it, try to kill any bacteria that are in there, and close it up and keep it sanitary, right? Well, what happens if you do all that, but the, you don't kill the bacteria and they're still in there and you can't get rid of them? You go to the doctor and the doctor takes a look at it and she goes, well, here's some antibiotics. I want you to stay on this course of antibiotics and we're going to knock this thing out, right? It's usually what occurs and it, and it kills it, takes care of it, right? But what if you get something like a staph infection where that little cut, there's no antibiotic that will cure it? Now we're in a bad situation and we're looking back in the dark ages going, well, do we just cut the arm off or the leg off? Because that's what they used to do. If you got inf a bad infection in your foot, the solution was cut your leg off, cauterize it, and hope for the best. There was no other, no other idea of what to do. Um, so it is scary that bacteria are evolving this resistance. It, it is kind of disturbing. When I, was, uh, when I was in high school, I'll tell you guys all these stories about my life, but my sister got a resistant staph infection. And I didn't know what this was. I didn't really know much about it. But I do remember that my parents were very worried. And they took her to the hospital. And she had this little dot on her leg. And she cut herself shaving. Just a little nick. And it looked like a pimple. That's all it looked like. And she was acting really sick and, and in a lot of pain. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, she's a wimp. Like, what's the big deal? I fall down on my skateboard all the time and skin my knees up, my arms up, my hands up. Like, I'm always cut up and she's complaining about this tiny little nick on her leg what a wimp like I didn't really realize that it was serious and it didn't make sense to me and then when I saw her in the hospital you know getting IV antibiotics and all kinds of stuff trying to take care of this thing I was like wow like that can happen so yeah the antibiotic resistance is really scary she recovered she's okay she's happily living in Florida <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a dangerous thing that we we try to monitor right but it's partly because of the way bacteria reproduce and their ability to swap DNA around that makes it that much worse. Here is what an endospore looks like. So here's the bacteria, and it's basically balled itself up in this end here. Sometimes they'll do it in the middle, um, but it can survive really nasty conditions. If you look at the picture, the microscopic picture, over here on the bottom right, there's one that's kind of got a little bulge in the middle right there. That's what we're looking at. It's an endospore. It's a little blurry. I think uh, Mr. Chastain actually took this picture down in our lab. There's a little bulb on the end of this one in the top right. Okay, you can see the little endospores there. So that's how they can survive nasty conditions. All right, gram staining. We are going to go down to lab next time I see you, and we are going to be using the gram stain. Uh, gram staining is a whole process, and I'll encourage you not to get this on your hands or your clothes because it will stain you just as well as it stains bacteria. The thing is, is to identify a bacteria, to figure out which antibiotics will kill it, to figure out what actually bacteria is causing you harm, we go through a process, and doctors do this, uh, called gram staining. And it, it's quite the process. It's a big recipe, and you'll have to do it very exactly. We'll do it over the sink so we don't get it all over ourselves. But you'll see there's different containers up here, things like ethanol um, and iodine and safranin um, and crystal violet. And we'll put those on in a very specific order. Okay, then we'll rinse them off and we'll go through this whole process. You will do, you have two types of bacteria, you'll do both at the same time. And the reason is because it's comparative. You want to be able to compare both slides. If you left one on longer than the other, you could have some really messed up results. You want to have them both done at the same time. I'll tell you that again when we get down there. But that's what we'll be doing next time I see you. Okay, I'd like you to write this down. 
In terms of the gram stain, there's two results, gram positive and gram negative. Okay, so jot down gram positive and gram negative. Now the reason they become positive or negative has to do with the cell wall. The cell wall of some of these things is gonna soak up more of the stain. Of the other type, it's gonna soak up less of the stain. It's gonna wash out. So you end up with two different colors. Let's see if we can figure them out here. We have, over here we have Bacillus subtilis, which is a type of bacteria. Bacillus is the genus, subtilis is the species, and it's gram positive. What color would you say these cells are over here? What do you think? It's a little hard to tell, isn't it? It's how it's gonna look in the microscope. What do you think? A bluish purple, awesome, fantastic. We usually say they're purple, okay? So, and in, in when I say that, I want you to look at a single bacterium. These, these are two here, these actually grow in chains. So they chain together, that's a single one right there that I'm showing you. And they're actually little rods, they're little tube-like looking things. Okay. Uh, if you look at a big clump of them all mashed up together, it's gonna look dark, it might even look black. So when you're looking at them in lab, you need to find a spot where there's very few of them to figure out your color. Don't look at this big clump and go, oh, it's, it's dark black or something. Because if you look over here at this one, that's gram negative, if you had a big clump of those, it would most certainly look purple if they're all piled up on top of each other. But if you look at where there's just a few, what color would you say the gram negatives look? Pink. And that's what we often say. Now, how pink they look depends on how you did the stain. If you left it on a little bit longer, they're going to be more red or more bluer, right? If you've washed it out pretty quick, you'll have it more pink. So it just depends on the stain. So you do both at the same time. Let me go down to that. And this is Escher Escher E. coli, E. coli. You've heard of E. coli before? E. coli infections. It lives in, lives in your intestines, lives in your gut. Um, e. coli can make you quite sick. Now, we won't mess with anything that's going to make you sick in lab, and we'll be very careful with it, so you don't need, really need to worry. But uh, some folks have probably heard of an E. coli infection before. If they get uh, sick from eating food sometimes, some food poisoning, um, that it can be from E. coli. Uh, you can get it in a cut. It can make you sick. So uh, it's kind of gross, right? If somebody's cooking your food and not washing their hands, and you get something like this, that's kind of nasty. So <laughs> these are also, if you look close here, these are single solitary little rods. They look like circles, don't they? But they're just really small little rods, like these things are longer rods there on the bacillus. They're littler rods, but they're quite pink, okay? Gram negative pink, have that down, gram positive purple. Positive purple, negative pink. You'll need that for your lab that we do. Okay, negative and positive. So like I said, doctors do this so that they can figure out what disease you have. They need to know which antibiotic's going to work, so they have to stain it. So the next step to identifying what bacteria you have is figuring out what its shape is. And there's three shapes we're going to look at. They're pretty basic. There is a cocos, which is a sphere or a circle. If you want to think of it that way, it's really a sphere. And if you look here at these, uh, there's two, they're kind of in pairs here, but if you take one of those off, there's like a little circle, okay? Uh, the rods that we just looked at under the bacillus. So the word bacillus actually means, is, is our word for rod. So when I said bacillus subtilis, that was its genus, but it's also its shape. Its shape is rod, okay? Cocos is spheres, bacillus is rod. There's a couple paired together there. And then this last one, Spirillum is spiral. That's easy to remember. Right? And you can look at these. Cocos has some C's and some O's in it. It's round. Bacillus has the two L's, so you think rod. Spirals, spirillum, you kind of can't mess that up. The spirillum here, it just kind of like, it's almost like a corkscrew is what it looks like. And this one has a, a whipped tail on both ends, two flagella on it. Um, there, uh, there are some spirochetes that are actually responsible for things like Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is, is caused by a bacteria, not a virus. And it, it, it's, there's something that looks kind of like this that makes you sick, okay? Everybody got those three down? That's the three. Okay. Okay. The next thing we need to know is the arrangement. This is what you're going to be using today, so write these down. 
We have diplo, staphylo, and strepto. Three words. So diplo means pairs. Oh, they can also come in singles, but we don't have a word for that. They can be, they can be solitary, like single, single things. So while each of these is its own cell, they're paired up. So diplo, think of dice, two dice. Diplo, pairs of cells. Staphylo is clusters or clumps. Kind of has that APH in there, so you might think like grape, like clumps of grapes. Staphylo is a clump. Uh, and then strepto, like a strip, is a chain of cells. Now they don't have to, like in these first two, these are spheres, I think. They don't have to be spheres. They could be bacilli. They could be rods, right? We're only going to see those spirillum, the, the spiral ones, as, as singles. But the other ones, you could have a diplococcus. Okay, you could have a diplobacillus. Diplobacillus would be pairs of what? Diplobacillus. Pairs of rods, right? See how that works? And that's how we name things. Does anybody recognize any of these words? Especially these two down here. We just talked about this one. Staphylo, where do you think staph infection gets its name? From a bacteria that happens to be in clusters, staph. How about strepto? Anybody ever have strep? Strep throat, yeah. We've all had strep throat, it's terrible, right? But we can take care of it. You go to the doctor and what happens? She gives you a, a, an antibiotic that specifically attacks this type of strep bacteria. Have you had that, uh, that little swab rammed in the back of your throat and you like gag and it's kind of horrible, but it's not nearly as bad as the COVID test? If you had the COVID test, you know what I'm talking about. They stuff that thing up your nose and tickles your brain and they twist it around a little bit and pull it out. And then they look at you and you're like, all right, now the other side. And you're like, whoa, whoa, there's nothing in the other side that wasn't in this side. And they're like, nope, too bad. We got to stick it in there anyway. They start putting it in. They're like, oh, just a couple more inches. It's going in there. I'm like, oh, no, it's pretty terrible, right? They're doing different ones now, so it's just like a little bit of your nose. It's not like the way back up in. You guys have had this. Have you had it go all the way up, like the long one? Or are they doing the shorter ones now? The sh yeah, okay. Well, you're lucky because early on, that thing was like six inches long, and they stuffed that up your nose, and you're like, you're looking at it, and they're holding it. And you're like, that's going in my nose? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was terrible. I've had a couple tests now. It's not much fun. And they'll do that for the flu, too. It's a similar one. For any, they, they also stick it up your nose. Um, yeah, it's great, isn't it? So, anybody catch what that's, a, what that's a picture of over there? Do you see it? Ah, yeah, it's a smiley face. Yes, yes. Bacterial cell humor at its best. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about how we, we fight these things. Antibiotics are our big one, and you should write down who that is there. Alexander Fleming. Antibiotics are a big one. We can't use antibiotics against viruses, right? So think of bio, bio is life. Viruses are not alive. That might be a way to remember it. Antibiotics work against bacteria. And we put Alexander Fleming up here, 1928, famous, famous guy. He developed penicillin, the very first antibiotic. And I know you've heard of penicillin. Some of you have probably had it. Anybody allergic to penicillin? Yeah, me too. So many of us are allergic to some antibiotics. We can't take them, but uh, science has developed many more that we can take, which is a good thing. We don't want to go back to the dark ages where you get an infection in your toe and we just cut your toe off. If that doesn't work, cut your foot off. If that doesn't work, take your leg off. Right? We don't want to go back to that. So antibiotics are a fantastic thing. Uh, Alexander Fleming's story is actually pretty funny. Uh, he was... He had a lab. He was a bit of a bit of an unclean lab, and uh, he hadn't cleaned it in a while. He had a bunch of petri dishes lying around. You'll see our petri dishes. We'll be using them down in the lab. And he was growing different bacteria in there and studying bacteria, trying to understand like what they were and how they worked. And uh, he went in, I think, to clean up one day and noticed that a little bit of or I think it was an orange uh, had fallen into one of his petri dishes that was covered in bacteria, and there was some mold on the orange. And you've seen this mold before. You've seen a moldy orange, just kind of like a round circle with like green and like, just like a little white rim around it, I think. Um, and wherever that mold was touching in the plate, uh, no bacteria was growing. Like it killed it. And being 
a, a smart guy, he noticed that and he didn't just clean the plate up. He was like, whoa, what happened here? <laughs> like, this, is, this, this mess that I made has actually got something to it. And he looked into it and figured out that the mold was actually inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. It's like phenomenal, like really cool thing. And so he, de he devised how that worked. And sure enough, like it was safe on humans. And so we have now penicillin, right? Now, how does penicillin work? We now understand how it works. Uh, what it does is it breaks the cell walls of the bacteria. And this only works against gram positives. So why do we gram stain? Well, partly we, we need to know which antibiotic is going to work. Okay? There's differences in the cell wall of different bacteria. And the gram positive have a very particular cell wall. It has this thing called peptidoglycan. And it kills them. Now here's how it works. A bacteria, as it's growing, gets bigger and bigger. Then it's going to copy its DNA, right? Then it's going to do binary fission. To do binary fission, it has to build a new cell wall between itself to divide into two. Well, back, penicillin screws up its ability to build a solid cell wall. So it builds this kind of crappy wall between the two cells, and when it tries to divide, it just pops. So it doesn't, it, penicillin doesn't just go in and wipe it out right away. It kills it when it tries to reproduce. Right? But it reproduces so rapidly that it doesn't take long. If you've had strep throat, for instance, you know like it doesn't take very long. You start to feel better. As soon as you get the antibiotics, like the next day, you're like, whoa, night and day. Like it really wipes it out. So antibiotics really truly are a miracle cure in many ways. Um, and now we have a lot of other antibiotics that interfere with different functions that, that do different things. They don't just fight the cell wall. We have some different stuff out there, and you might have heard of some of those. We'll look at more of those when we do this lab, actually. So one of the other things we're going to do on our lab day next time around is we're going to look at the effectiveness of antibiotics. And here's how we do it. It's just an experiment. This is a Petri dish. The whitish stuff that looks kind of streaky is a lawn of bacteria. Now, Mr. Chastain's making these up for us. What he does is he gets bacteria and he streaks it across this medium that has like algae and, and just stuff that bacteria love to eat in it. And then the bacteria grows. And there's so much of it, there's millions upon millions of bacteria in there that you can actually see it. That whitish stuff is just thick bacteria growing. Okay. Before he starts growing it though, he puts these little discs in there and they're labeled. Each of those discs has been, their paper discs have been soaked in an antibiotic. And then they sit on there. And then we incubate it, we heat it up where bacteria are super happy and they grow, but there's some regions where they can't grow. Okay, and you, so you look at this and you're like, oh, okay, if these are antibiotics, uh, how much do you want to have antibiotic A if this bacteria is what's infecting you? Not at all, right? But how about, how about antibiotic E? Yeah, I want some antibiotic E. That's going to wipe this out really fast. And so that's how we can determine the effectiveness of, of an antibiotic. Now we'll measure these. They're called zones of inhibition. Measure in millimeters or centimeters from one end across the disc all the way to the other end. So that zone where there's nothing growing all the way over the disc is what we'll measure in our lab. And we'll figure out how effective they are. But zone of inhibition is the words you'll want to know. We're going to be using those words. Now, not all bacteria are dangerous. Some of them you really need. There are some vitamins your body can't even, can't even produce without a bacteria in it. There's certain bacteria that we need. They live in our intestines. They help us digest our food. They help us make vitamins. They recycle nutrients through our ecosystem. They're super important. In fact, we use some to make food, like cheese and yogurt. Uh, if you've ever looked on the back of a yogurt container, if you haven't, you should, you might see something like down here, it says contains active culture ingredients, L. acidophilus. Well, acidophilus is the type of bacteria we use to make yogurt. So what this is telling you, this label is telling you is that this container contains yogurt with live creatures in it, live bacteria. It's not a bad thing. It's very healthy for your intestinal tract to have this stuff in it. So it's totally fine. Okay, and we use this stuff to make uh, different foods. Uh, we also use these things in the preparation of antibiotics uh, and, of course, uh, recycling nutrients in the environment. Okay? So they're not all bad. 
Maybe we want to kill all viruses. Well, they're not alive. We want to destroy them all, but we shouldn't get rid of all bacteria. We certainly need bacteria. All right, guys. So we're going to open up now, we'll open up our computers. And there are two things on there. One is a prokaryote reading quiz, and the other is a bacteria ID paper.